is our love person and she is um, our administrator for HR. So she's just here to basically answer really complicated questions um, and tell me if I say anything wrong because she's an expert and I'm not um, in HR items. So that being said, thank you for starting the recording, Mary. Um, let's see. Okay. All right, so let's get started. Workplace uh, readiness week. All right, let's talk about your rights as a worker. So it's very important before you start working or if you already are to just know um, what you're entitled to. So first I wanna let you know, this is a lot of information and I am act it's actually condensed. I have more on our YouTube channel. So if you visit our YouTube channel, there are little videos like 10, 15 minute videos for every single topic that we're covering today. So it will go in more in depth into the topic and it will provide resources. And there's also a link for this slide um, in the YouTube description. So if you do want to learn more about workplace rights, or if this is a lot of information to take in and you just want to watch this when you get a job, that's perfectly fine. Um, obviously when it doesn't apply to you, it's really hard to learn it. So just keep that in mind that this is always here for you, um, even if you graduate. All right, so here's all the things we're going to cover. This is why there's no fun in game. That's kind of a lot of information. We're going to talk about um, classification of workers, child labor laws, uh, wage and hour protections, worker safety, workers' compensation, unemployment insurance, sick time off, um, and your right to organize, and also prohibitions against retaliation. So it's a lot of big words. It's a lot of new concepts. So I'm going to give you a broad overview. So hopefully you know where to look for these resources. All right. First, if you're interested in working, you probably are thinking, well, how do I get started? You'll need a work permit. If you are a student or under the age of 18, you do need a work permit to start working. Um, there are two main types of work permits. There's one for just general jobs. So for example, if you're working at Starbucks um, or as a cashier or in retail, you'll fill out this first form, CD form B11, um, or CDE, sorry. It's really just for anyone who wants to work in a non-entertainment industry. If you're interested in becoming an actor or working in theater, this is a completely different permit. So the entertainment industry does have a separate permit. So just think of the job you want to have and just fill out the appropriate forms. Um, I will type in the chat, the form links in case you are interested in working during high school. So the first form, the form for all non um non industry uh entertainment industry uh workers you would fill out this first form and then for entertainment industry only so if you're if you want to be an actor and you want to start working as an actor um during high school you would want to fill out this form oh it's really hard to talk and type at the same time and spell Okay, here's a link for that second permit. Um, just be aware that there are two separate permits for that. All right, so the steps. One, you have to be in good academic standing. So again, you're in high school. That means high school comes first. Your graduation requirements, that's what I care about. That's what you should also focus on. So if you have good grades, and you don't have to have straight A's, but if you have good grades and you're on track to graduate on time, you will be able to work at the same time. If you do not have those grades and if you are struggling to graduate on time, we are not going to sign off on a work permit for you. So you do have to be in good academic standing. Obviously, if there's certain circumstances, um, let your homeschool teacher know. Um, for example, if your family is reliant on you working and your salary, work with your homeschool teacher. We can um, kind of give you goals to meet in order to give you a work permit. So just keep that in mind. Um, and then you would download the appropriate form, fill out all of your information, and then submit it to either your homeschool teacher or our records department. So you can send those forms completed and then we'll get that back to you signed and approved within two to three business days. Okay. 
And again, if you have any questions, I'm going to try to go fast. So if there are any questions, you can feel free to pop it in the chat or save them for the end of this. Um, all right. Child labor laws. Guess what? These weren't always in place. When you were like 10, way back when, about 100 years ago, you would probably be working in a coal mine and it was terrible. Um, but luckily, we all have wonderful child labor laws that really um, help guide what employers can and can't do and um, really help protect kids like you. Um, so there's quite a bit here. This chart kind of condenses. There's different jobs you can work depending on your age and the diff there's different hours you can work as well. So if you're 16 or 17, you would need to complete seventh grade um, in order to work. Well, obviously if you're in high school, you've completed seventh grade, so we don't have to worry about that. Um, during the school day, so when school is in session, you can only work a maximum of 48 hours a week and you can only work four hours during a school day. I know you're in independent study, so sometimes you roll out of bed at noon and you start working and then you finish your uh, schoolwork. So you wanna work, um, you know, it, it's a very flexible day. Sometimes you push all your work and just procrastinate and do a lot of last minute studying on the last few days. That's also possible in this model, but just know that for work, uh, for child labor laws, you do have to follow this minimum. You can only work four hours during a school day. So even if your schedule is a little bit flexible with homeschool, you still are limited to four hours per school day and eight hours on a non-school day. So if there's a school holiday, for example, and we're not um, we're not on camp or not on campus, but not in session, you can work eight hours. If it's a weekend, you can also work eight hours. So just know when you're looking for a job, the employers will also need to adjust um, and you might have limitations on what hours you can do in a day because of this. Um, and when it's not in session, you can work eight hours every day. So like in the summertime or during winter break, for example, um, when there is no school, you can work eight hours a day, still 48 hours maximum. Um, and you're limited to 5 a.m. to 10 p.m. You cannot work, uh, you know, at 3 a.m. in the morning. That's a little too dangerous for students. Um, so that's why there is restrictions on what times you can work as well. Um, if it's a non-school day, there's also a little, like if you're, if there's no school the next day. So if you want to work on a Friday night, you can actually work till 1230 um, PM or AM, I guess, because you're working past midnight. Um, if the next day is not a school day. And this is only for 16 and 17 year olds. For 14 and 15, it's more restricted. So the younger you get, the fewer hours you're able to work. You are limited now to only 18 hours per week, three hours during the school day and eight hours during non-school days. Um, and again, you'll see a little bit of uh, tightening of like when you can and can't work. So seven to seven for younger students. Um, for 12 and 13 year olds, this is very rare. Usually students won't be working at this young of an age, but um, if you are, you can only work during holidays, uh, breaks, and weekends, so non-school days. You cannot work during a school day at all. You, the primary focus should be school. All right. I don't see any questions so far, so I'm going to move on. And again, these slides will be shared with you, so don't feel like you have to copy every single thing. I know it's a lot of information. There's also a lot of hyperlinks, so this will be shared with you so you can um, get access to everything. There are work hour limitations. So what I just went over, this is the, um, this is the maximum you can work. It is in the right of school officials to restrict that maximum. So for example, if you're struggling in school and we need you to graduate on time, we can say, this student is not able to work the maximum 48 hours. We are only going to allow them to work 20 hours a week. So we can restrict that. Typically, I will let you know, we don't unless there is an issue with graduation requirements, unless you're not, um, you know, we talked about good academic standing. So if you're not in good academic standing, that is um, going to be problematic. All right, I do have a question in the chat directly to me. Um, could a 10 year old go to work? Is that illegal? 10 year olds cannot work, sorry. Um, well, 
You can babysit and help your parents, but you really can't officially work. Okay. Um, and then I do want to say once you have earned your diploma or earn or or reach the age of 18, then these hour restrictions do not apply. You do not need a work permit. You are technically an adult. So you actually do get to make adult des decisions and um, work with adults guidelines now instead of the child labor ones. Okay, so there's actually also on top of hours limitations to what you can and cannot do. So this is a lot. Basically, if you're in high school, you cannot work dangerous jobs. You cannot work with big machines with sharp knives. Sorry, if that's like, if you really wanted to do that, you can't. Um, and then for, but most high school students will be able to work for businesses owned by their parents, jobs out of the home, um, an act as an actor or performer. Sorry, I do have one stipulation. There was a question about can 10 year olds work? Sorry, Deanna. Thank you so much for correcting me, Deanna. Um, there is an exception for the entertainment industry. That's why there's a whole different form. If you are a child actor, you can work, but also, those are very protected. There are limitations to how much you can work um, as a child actor, for example. So in the entertainment industry, you can work when you're even younger than 12. Um, all right. If we, I will share this link as well, but there is a great resource from the Department of Labor. It pretty much tells you every single job. You cannot work with power saws. You cannot work as a roofer. You cannot work in meat processing. So there's a very long list. Usually, if you're looking for a job at Starbucks, you'll be fine. But if you're thinking of anything else, just use your common sense. Is is there potential danger there? If you obviously you can't work with explosives, even if you want to, um, but it's a very long list. But when you really condense it down, pretty much if it's hazardous, children will not be able to work there. Um, there is a very comprehensive list and it actually... Uh, you can also, um, I believe there is another chart for, this is all under 18, but you can also look for um, jobs that 12 year olds and 13 year olds can work because that's even more restricted. Um, all right, I will, I will also share that link in the chat in case anyone is curious, but this is a general guideline, what you cannot work, it's pretty much anything dealing with heavy machinery, anything that could be hazardous. All right. Okay, um, other resources, again, I'll share the link to this PowerPoint so you can have all of these child labor laws if you want to know everything, all the restrictions. I only covered the bare basics of what you really need to know about the hours you can work. Um, but the child labor law, this PDF is very extensive and it will go through every single uh, thing in detail. Uh, we also have youthrules.gov. This kind of, this is a great um this is a great resource and it will tell you what jobs you can and can't work. So that is um, available for you too. Okay. Next, wage and hour protection. So how many hours can you work and how many breaks should you get and how much can you get paid? Um, really quickly, there is a difference between exempt and non-exempt. The definition is not quite... It's not my favorite. <laughs> exempt just means you aren't protected by wage and hour laws. Non-exempt means you are protected by wage and hour laws. Um, it's not really up to, uh, it's actually up to uh, California labor law to determine your employment status. And I gave a few examples of the types of jobs. So you can kind of look at um, what, who is non-exempt and who is exempt. Usually, for example, school administrators like myself, um, Deanna, who is, you know, the HR administrator, we are not exempt. Uh, we're exempt. So that means we don't have wage and hour protections. We usually have a salary. We also um, can work overtime. Uh, so it's it's pretty, um, oh, sorry, it, it is limited. or it, it means you don't have wage and hour protections. And then there's also, if you're working in retail, just know that if you are making 1.5 times the minimum wage, 
and you get um, more of a, and you get most of your salary from commission. Like basically if you're working for Louis Vuitton and you're selling those bags, you're probably getting a commission. You're probably getting more um, than the minimum wage. You would be exempt. You would not have hour and wage protections. Um, most of you in high school would actually be a non-exempt employee. That means you are protected by these laws. So if you're a cashier, you're a waiter, you're a construction worker, um, pretty much you are going to be protected by what I'm going to go over next. Um, all right. Oh. Thank you, Deanna. You should just put in the chat that exempt. Usually it means you're making two times the minimum wage. So if you're making two times, you're making double minimum wage, um, you are probably an exempt employee. If you're making close to minimum wage, you're probably going to be a non-exempt. All right, so wage protections. So labor law means that there, one, your employer needs to notify you what your wage rate is. So when you get hired for a job, make sure you get a verbal and written, if possible, written is best, um, a verbal or written agreement of what you will be paid. You want to know before you start working, how much are you going to get paid? And you should also know you are entitled to get paid the minimum wage. So if the minimum wage is Right now, the minimum wage is $7.25 for the federal minimum wage, but you are actually entitled to a higher minimum wage because you're lucky we live in California. California minimum wage is $16. So the least amount you can get paid right now is $16. And as of April 1st, 2024, there was a law passed that fast food workers are entitled to $20 of minimum wage. So if you are working at a Starbucks or a McDonald's, you are entitled to $20 minimum wage. Why it's important to know what the minimum wage is, um, you want to, once you get your first paycheck, you wanna make sure, you wanna double check that you are getting paid what you're owed and that you're not going, that your employer isn't paying you below minimum wage. They have to pay you at least whatever the state or the federal level is. Also state, uh, county and cities will also have different minimum wages. Um, you would calculate that by whatever is the highest minimum wage. You That's what you're entitled to. All right, and tips. So tip, tips are separate from your regular pay. So if you're working at a restaurant and you're a waiter, you would get minimum wage and tips on top of your minimum wage. You your managers, your supervisors, and the owners cannot take your tips. I, because you're young, and if this is your first job, sometimes you don't realize that. Sometimes your employer might say that the tips are pooled together and they get paid out of it. That's incorrect. Um, managers, supervisors, and owners cannot take those tips away from the workers, okay? So be very clear if you are working in the, rest, in the restaurant um, that you are entitled to your tips, and that is on top of your minimum wage, okay? All right, we do see a few. Oh, okay. There are um, a few things in the chat just about tips. Um, there are front of the house uh, and back of the house. So sometimes uh, tips are split. So for example, the hostess, the waiter might, that's the front of the house, your face, everyone, the customers will see your face. Usually that's separated from a pool and then um, the back of the house will also get tips from, uh, usually when you go to a restaurant, you're tipping on a bill, they might split that between the front and the back. So waiters and hostesses will get a portion of that tip and sometimes the cooks as well. Um, it's, you know, they, though you don't see them while you're eating, um, sometimes it, they put in a lot of work into your dish. So that's something you should be, uh, keep in mind that sometimes those tips are split between workers, just Keep in mind, managers, supervisors, and owners are a different category. Um, all right. Okay. Um, work week. So you are also, um, all non-exempt employees are entitled to basically, they can work eight hours in a single day. They can also work 40 hours in a work week. 
and for a maximum of six consecutive days in a work week. If you go over any of those, that means you are entitled to overtime. So if you work 41 hours in a week, you that one hour that you go over, you are entitled to overtime pay for that one hour. So overtime rate means you're getting paid 1.5 what the rate uh what the daily rate is now. Uh, or what your regular wage rate. Um, just keep in mind that only applies to whatever you go over. So if you're working 40 hours a week and you go over by five hours, then you're getting paid for those five hours at 1.5, your normal rate. Um, so for example, if you're getting paid the $16 for minimum wage, you work five extra hours, you get $24 an hour for those five hours. And remember the age restrictions. If you're if you're 16 and 17, you can work over 40 hours. Any other age, if you're younger, you cannot work over 40 hours. So just keep that in mind. Not all of you will be able to work overtime. All right, so a fun math problem for you. Did you know that we were gonna do math today? <laughs> um, so if you're a 17 year old worker who's working in the summer and you're working Monday through Sunday, eight hours a day, how much should you get paid? So this is just a little example of why you want to know about overtime pay. So if you're working 48 hours, you're working Monday through Saturday for six consecutive days in the summer, you're going over your maximum 40 hours by eight hours, right? So that means you are entitled to eight hours of overtime pay. Okay, so I did break it down for you just in case you need help with your math, um, but uh, I just wanted you to know how much you should get paid. So if you do work overtime, make sure you work it all out and you do check your, um, your paycheck as well, just so that you are aware of what you should be paid. All right. And this is obviously assuming that you're getting paid the minimum wage as well. Um, if there are changes in these parameters, so for example, if you're 15 years old, you can't work those 48 hours, so you actually can't um, can't really go over 40, so you're not going to get overtime. If school is in session, then you can't work eight hours each day either. So this is very specific to this scenario, so just know that as your scenario changes, this could look different. I just wanted to give you a quick example of how to calculate overtime pay. Um, okay, breaks. So you should also um, understand that um, for five hours in a workday, if you work five plus hours, you are entitled to 30 minutes of unpaid meal breaks. So that means you do get a lunch break or a dinner break, depending on when you're working. And it has to be uninterrupted. So that means your employer cannot come in and say, hey, can you go handle that? Can you go do something for me right now? Um, they are interrupting your lunch. It has to be an uninterrupted break for meals and it is unpaid. So just know they don't have to pay you for you to eat, but they do have to give you those 30 minutes to eat. Um, if you're working 12 hours or more in a day, then you're entitled to another meal break. Um, and for every four hours, you are entitled to a 10 minute rest break. So that means you do get 10 minutes to rest um, and you can rest somewhere else. Um, you don't have to actually rest at the workplace. All right. This is a lot. I'm sorry, guys. The 3.5 hour workday you're entitled to at least one break. If you're working for six hours, you're entitled to two breaks. If you're working for 10 or more hours, you're entitled to three breaks and three 10 minute breaks throughout the day. Um, ideally that rest break should be in the middle of your work period. So if you're working from eight to 12, you should ideally try to take that break sometime around 10. So somewhere in the middle. Um, if you can't, because of the nature of your work, that's also allowed, but just always, it's supposed to be around the middle. Um, and remember that rest breaks are paid. And your boss cannot require you to remain on the premises during your meal break and your rest breaks. Um, and they cannot require you to work during that time. Um, but you are able to skip your rest break. Uh, just know that I would recommend it a long work day. You, I, I want to take advantage of all my breaks, but um, but you are able to skip your break, but they cannot make you work during your break, if that makes sense. Um, you cannot skip your meal break, though. You do have to take that meal break. All right. 
So here's another math problem for you. If your shift started at 9.05 a.m. and you finished working at 5.32 p.m., how many breaks and how many lunch breaks do you get? Or meal breaks, sorry. Um, this is much too complicated for me to work out. Um, so I actually found a nice little handy dandy calculator for you. So if you do put in, for example, um, a start time, an end time, and a how many lunch, uh, lunch minutes you get, or I keep saying lunch because I'm assuming you're working during the day, but a meal break, how many minutes you get for the meal break, you can calculate that. And then you can also um, get a breakdown of how many breaks you are allowed throughout the whole day. Um, in this case, you are allowed two 10 minute breaks because you're working uh, close to eight hours, oh, so over six hours, and you also get a meal break for this one. Okay, so there's some links here. Um, if you, if your employer is requiring you to work during a break, for example, you can actually um, file a complaint because they're not supposed to interrupt that break. They're not supposed to make you work. That's supposed to be your choice. Uh, so there are, um, you can visit the Department of Labor. So again, all of these protections are in place for you. If you do think your employer is um, violating one of these, you can also file a claim. Okay. Excuse me one okay. second, Miss Linda. Yes. Um, in, in line with what you just went over, I think everybody who presents on Friday Focus should get a brief break after 30 minutes. So I also want to give you a question that came up in the chat. And uh, the student asked, what if their policy, there being your employer's policy, requires you to stay on the premises on the break or lunch, or is that not allowed? I think you already answered that, but would you comment on that, please? Yeah, you can actually leave the premises um, for your breaks. You're entitled to do so. This, this is Deanna. It's not, okay. legal. It, it's not legal for them to require you to stay on premises. Thank you. And I think there was another question in the chat, but I might say that to the end because it's a little bit more complicated. Oh, actually it's not that complicated. Uh, let me go back a slide if I can. <laughs> um, there we go. Uh, the question is if you're paid under the minimum wage, would you be eligible to sue? What would you do? I am not a lawyer. I cannot give you legal advice, but uh, your employer does have to pay you minimum wage, okay? So if you think your employer is not paying you minimum wage, I would visit the labor commissioner's office or that website. That does mean um, there, that's something called wage theft, pretty much. You're guaranteed the minimum. If you're, for example, if you worked a few several hours and they're still paying you the rate, but they're counting the hours as less than you actually work, that's wage theft. If you're, they're paying you at a lower hourly rate, if they're paying you um, something different than what you agreed on originally, you would want to visit the labor commissioner's office and actually file a wage claim. And you might also want to file a complaint as well. If you think there is a violation, um, if that doesn't resolve something, then that is entirely up to you how far you want to take it. If you want to sue, if you want to get lawyers involved, there are lots of labor attorneys, believe me, there's <laughs> there's there's a lot because, um, um, but I will say in general, employers, large companies will not be in violation of this. It's basically like Deanna's job to make sure we're in, not in violation of any of this. So we make sure that all of our employees have breaks, they take the breaks when they're supposed to, and that all the pay and everything is, um, completed appropriately, because if your employer is in violation, they can, all, in addition to having to pay you, they will also get fined. So it's not in the interest of the employer to basically pay you less than the minimum wage. It is not, um, they, if they get caught, it, it is more trouble for them than it's worth um, saving like a couple dollars here and there because they're paying you less. Um, so typically it doesn't happen, but if it does, these are the resources here for you. You can file a complaint. You also can try to claim some of those wages back as well. 
And that's why we're going over all this. So if you do work overtime, if you are working for an employer, you want to know how much you're entitled to so that if you're checking your pay stub and something seems off, you can always talk to your employer um, and see if there was a mistake, but you can also have these resources um, for you to kind of follow up and try to get your wages back because you are entitled to every if you're working, you should get paid for what you're doing. And, and this is Vienna again. Yeah. Also, just so that everyone's aware, the look back period is four years. So you can go back as far as four years to claim any of those um, wages that were not appropriately, um, and even meal breaks. Like if your meal break wasn't um, given to you properly or it wasn't given by a certain time, um, they there are meal penalties, so it has to be within the first five hours. And um, if you weren't given that additional hour of pay, then your your employer would also owe you a, a meal penalty, and that also goes back for four years. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So just I think the question about is your employer required to have you stay on, on site during your meal break. If they also require you to work during your meal break, that means you're getting paid less than you're supposed to because you're now working during your unpaid required lunch break. If you're required to work during your lunch break, then that means they should be paying you for any extra work you're doing. So that is also something you can take up with these, um, the departments of labor and all of that. Okay, all right, worker safety. All right, so OSHA was established in 1970. Um, it's an administration to make sure basically there are healthy working conditions for you. Believe it or not, a lot of um, factories and working conditions, if you studied US history, you would know they were very unsafe conditions. Um, there weren't, if you look at your any building now, there's fire alarms, there's fire escapes, there's mandates um, for how, how many exits you have it in a building. That's kind of all thanks to OSHA. Um, so OSHA manages all that and makes sure that um, employers are creating a safe working environment for their employees. So what that means is you have a right to a safe workplace. You also have the right to raise safety concerns. So if you see something that's dangerous and you raise it to your employer, they should address it and help um, try to make sure that that safety concern is um is addressed. And then uh, you also can raise these concerns without fear of retaliation. Uh, you can report, you have the right to report work-related injuries and illnesses also. So if you get hurt on the job, you can report that and your employers cannot retaliate against you for reporting an injury. Um, you have the right to file a complaint with OSHA. So if you think something um, is very hazardous at your workplace or if you are being retaliated against, um, you can report that to OSHA. Um, you also have the right to receive information and training about the job hazards. So if you start a job, um, your employer does have to train you about all the potential dangers. They also have to teach you about um, protective equipment that can prevent injuries or illnesses. Um, you also have the right to request a OSHA inspection. So if, for example, you see something dangerous um, like chemicals that are stored improperly at the workplace, you raise it to your employer, you raise that concern, they do not address it and do not fix it, you can actually request a OSHA inspection. Um, and it would be confidential, they would just come on site and they would actually inspect everything and you can, you also have the right to participate in that inspection. Mm -hmm. um, and you have the right to see any OSHA citations that your employer may have gotten. And you can also request copies of your own medical records and tests um, and measure hazards in the workplace as well. Um, and if there is a workplace injury log, then you have the right to also see that as well. So if there's multiple employees getting injured at your workplace, one, I probably would reconsider working there um, because it's probably unsafe, but you do have the right to review all of that and kind of um, get a sense of what kind of employer you're working for. All right, so what do I do if there's a dangerous situation at work? So one, you can file a complaint with OSHA. If possible, you should bring those conditions to your employer's attention and see if they can fix it in a timely manner. If they cannot, um, if 
the danger is if the condition is actually posing a serious threat. So you think you're going to be seriously harmed or you're, it puts you in, you know, in the risk of death, for example, and OSHA cannot inspect it in time. You actually have the legal right to refuse to work. So you can tell your employer that I will not work until this is resolved because this is too dangerous for me. Okay, so just make sure that you know that you do have the right to refuse work if it's a very dangerous situation. Um, some other things that you might want to do is visit the OSHA administration. They have a poster that has to be uh, posted at your workplace about your rights. Um, you can file a complaint with them. There's a link there um, through their website. Uh, and then there's the Department of Industrial Relations that also regards uh, OSHA standards and uh all of that for California specifically. All right. Paid leave. Oh, okay. All right. Paid leave. So if you are sick or a family member is sick, um, you do have rights to take some time off of work. So for example, um, there's different types. There's paid time off. There's a lot of these terms. Um, so paid family medical leave. So let's talk about the first one. This one means that um, it just is a policy that allows you to receive compensation. So you will still receive a salary if you have to take an extended time off from work for reasons like you have a new child and you want to bond with that child, or if you're recovering from a serious illness, or you need to care for a serious um, a loved one who is seriously ill as well. So that would be paid, but not at your normal wage, it would be reduced. It's about 60 to 70% of your normal wage rate, but you are also entitled to do that if you meet the criteria. So it doesn't mean I want to take a vacation and get paid. It means that you specifically someone is ill or you have a new child and you want to bond with that child or, um, and again, when it's a close family member that's sick, you are able to also um, take medical leave to take care of them, but it's not any family member. It is specific family members. Um, paid sick time, usually employer, well, actually not usually, they have to offer you sick time. Um, there are policies around how many uh, sick days you'll have, how you'll accrue them as well. Um, and then there is also paid time off. So this is paid time off. This is just a way for employers to group everything. So if they don't want to have different policies for if you're sick, or if you have a vacation, or if there's an emergency, sometimes they'll just group it all into uh, one and just say you have you are entitled to pay time off. And then unpaid time off means you are taking time off of work and you are not getting paid at all. Okay. A question, Miss Linda. Yes. Do you have to prove the sickness or the birth of the child or or something? You have to provide proof for that. Um. If your employer asks, yes, you do. And also if you're looking for the paid family leave mm -hmm. um, and also like the pregnancy disability leave, you would definitely need to have that proof um, because it goes to EDD and you only qualify for that. You you qualify for the, the baby bonding and all of that regardless of um, whether or not you're getting a wage supplement, but in order to to qualify for the paid family leave and the wage supplement, you do have to have worked for a minimum of one year with that employer and a minimum of twelve uh, of 1,250 hours and, and have paid into state disability insurance. Thank you, Deanna. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, you do have to pay a work for a longer period of time about, um, and there is minimum requirements to get the paid leave. So just keep in mind that that first one is um, there are requirements and there's a lot, there's forms that you have to fill out and submit um, to do all of that. But to take the actual time off, you don't always need documentation. It's up to your employer whether they require it or not, um, whether they ask you for it. So if you're taking like one day of sick time off, usually they won't ask, but if you're taking multiple sick days, um, and all in a row, they might ask you for a doctor's note or proof, then if they ask, then you do have to provide that. Okay, so paid sick time is what we're going to talk about in detail. 
um, right now, you are California paid sick leave. You, so employers have to, um, who work for 30 days or more within a year is entitled to pick paid sick leave. So if you just started a job, unfortunately, you don't have any sick days yet. You do have to work for a small period before you do start earning the sick uh, leave. Um, it is paid at your regular wage. So you, if you're getting minimum wage, if you're getting paid $16 an hour and you have to take a sick day, you're still getting paid for that sick day. Um, employers are in employees are entitled to 40 hours or five days, whichever is more. So for example, if an employer, uh, if an employee works 10 hours a day, then for five days, that would actually be about 50 hours of paid sick leave. So they're entitled to five days of leave. They can take and they work normally 10 hours for each of those days. So they actually get 50 hours of paid leave. Um, if you're working for only six hours every day, you're actually not working the 40 hours um, total in a week. Right. So but you're you're still entitled to those additional hours. So, for example, if you're working only six hours for each of those um, five days, you're technically only working 30 hours. You still actually have 10 more hours of sick time. So it's whatever is more you do. You're entitled to 40 hours or five days. Um, OK, and then paid sick leave does accrue at the rate of one hour per 30 hours work. So every 30 hours that you work, you do get one hour of sick time off. So to take a full day off, you do have to work for quite some time. Um, and it's up to the employer how they want to give you the time off. So some employers use an accrual system. So this rate, they will use that. So they really do count how many hours you work and that's how many hours you get of sick time. And some employers are really nice and they just say, we're gonna give you five days or 40 hours right at the beginning of the year that you're working. Um, sometimes they will give that to you right away. So you'll want to check your employment contract to see um, just to see how many sick days you have from the very start. OK, and sick leave is also rolled over um, every year, but it is capped. So you can only have a total of 80 hours per year or 10 days per year. You can't go over that. Anything that goes over that you you lose. Essentially, you only get to roll over a portion. Um, OK, um, we have a question. What about part time jobs where the schedule fluctuates week by week? Um, your employer would probably utilize a accrual system. Then they're probably going to count how many hours if you're if your schedule fluctuates quite a bit, then they're probably going to count how many hours you worked and then give you those um, hours of sick time. And then you're able to take it. You're probably going to take hourly sick leave instead of like a full day. Um, so you're probably going to just be entitled to like 40 hours for the whole year to take off. But again, there is, um, um, hold on, I think there's a requirement for how many days or how many hours you, you have to work to, um, to get all that. Okay. Uh, what else? All right. There we go. So you also, um, you are, you can only use paid sick days at the beginning of your 90th day. So you're saving all of these sick days you can only use them after three months of working at the employee, uh, the company. Um, so just keep that in mind. <laughs> you only can start that. Sometimes your employers are super nice and they might let you um, use your sick day a little bit ahead of time, but you, um, you know, you're legally, they only have, they can restrict when you use that sick time. Um, employers, employers also, um, need to provide you the sick day upon request. So if you are sick and you request that time off, they are supposed to give that to you. If they say no, you have to come in because they're short staffed. Um, you can just let them know, no, sorry, I am sick. I cannot come in. Um, they might ask for a doctor's note at that point, which you will then have to provide and prove that you were sick. Um, employers can also limit the use of how many sick days. So you still get 40 hours and or five days in a year, but they might limit how you use that. So maybe they might say you can't use three days in a row, for example. They might limit it that way, but you are still entitled to that for the whole year. They just might limit how many you can use consecutively or something like that. Um, they can also cannot discriminate or retaliate against you if you take a sick day. So if you call in sick, 
and they really wanted you there and they're now mad at you and they retaliate, they cannot do that. So they cannot cut your hours. They cannot adjust your schedule to give you really terrible shifts um, because you took a sick day. Right. So you'll notice all the resources. There's a lot of links everywhere. This is a lot to dig deep into, um, but pretty much it, all of these websites are government websites and they really do break um, break down all, everything you're entitled to. I wouldn't, I don't want to go into detail to every one of these because I will be honest with you, I didn't read any of this until I needed it. So for example, um, two years ago, I got pregnant. I had to take leave from my work and I also had, to, I wanted to make sure I got paid for that leave. So that's when I Luckily, like our HR department, it's really nice when you tell them you need to take medical leave, they will provide you with all the information. And I was able to, um, whoops, take some, um, take some time off and submit all the forms. And they told me what kind of doctor notes and everything I needed to submit. And that's when I looked into all the facts about pregnancy disability leave, because it's a lot different from just sick time off. So I would recommend saving the slide, saving these links for if you do need disability leave, if you are sick, if a family member, um, I hope no family members are sick, but if you do need to take care of a close family member and you need to take that time off um, and you would like to get paid for it, you can also look at these links and find out more information and see if you qualify. Not just any worker qualifies, there are rules um, about how much you have worked for an employer before you're able to um, access any of these. Um, but you can also visit our YouTube channel, which I will share. There's a lot of things for me to share today, but you can also watch our YouTube channel to look at every single one, because I do talk about all the different types of leave you're entitled to as well. Miss Linda, I have a question here about, um, and, and it basically says, is that the max days sick off until they unemploy you? Yeah. That, I'm not 100% sure. <laughs> Exactly how that um, is. So if you, so the sick time off is, I do want to really highlight it is paid sick time. So if you are sick long term, then you are entitled to also unpaid time off, but there's no protections about that. So um, just, just keep in mind, you're entitled to 40 hours of paid sick time and five or five days of paid sick time. So if you're sick for that amount for a year, um, you will get paid for those. Anything above and beyond that, it is unpaid. So your employers do not have to pay you for a six day if you're sick. You know, if you get the flu like multiple times because you have siblings who are in school and they just bring all the germs to you, that happens sometimes. And you might have six or seven or eight days of sickness uh, in a year. So that's possible. That would be unpaid. Um, the nice thing is if you have worked for an employer for a long time, you do have some sick days that roll over. So you do have additional days. Um, but if there is a serious illness, then you are, um, you are entitled to job protections. So for example, um, oh yeah. Oh, you know what, Deanna, please, <laughs> please share. Yeah, so um, there's something that's called FMLA, and if you have met that full year of work and you've worked the minimum hours of the 1,250, um, then you qualify for something that's called FMLA. It's a uh, Family Medical Leave Act, and that is actually a job protection. It works together with, with disability insurance, but um, the actual job protection is the FMLA, and you have up to 12 weeks in a one full year that you're able to use that if it's authorized by your doctor and all of that good stuff. Um, so if you end up needing to take additional time, you have those wage supplements that can help with the with the pay. But as far as your job is concerned, you have those 12 weeks and they can't make you take it um, all together. So like say you had a condition that needed to uh, you needed to have certain time off to go to a doctor's appointment, like maybe every Friday or whatever and you have that documented it could be intermittent so it and when you um when you apply for it you you decide whether you're going to apply with uh, for that whole 12 weeks altogether or separate it out so basically that's those 12 weeks are your job protection and they cannot retaliate against you um for taking any of that leave that is protected mm -hmm. 
Um, and what Deanna said is that family FMLA is family medical leave. So right under U.S. Department of Labor, there's more information there. And it kind of breaks down that it is um, it is basically job protection. So you are able to leave for an extended time for your work for medical reasons. Um, and you will have your job after you um, that medical leave is completed. And then there's additional insurance, disability insurance that pays out um, if you need wage supplements. But again, there's minimums that you have to meet, okay? Um, but all of those are linked here. So if you do think you need have a medical condition and you need extended time off of work, one, you have to work for that employer for a long enough period. But if you are entitled to that leave, then you want you would want to visit the US Department of Labor for more information. Um, all right. And I think uh, he, the, the person um, kind of qualified his question too. And he said, um, what is the maximum number of days off sick you can take until they unemploy you or fire you? And I think what you're saying is that um, there are some that are protected, but there is some that is not protected if you, do, if you don't meet certain criteria. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and so you can be disciplined if you don't have a protected leave. So if you're not, you don't have a condition that would require FMLA, you could be disciplined up to termination if you're uh, what they would consider abusing the the um, the leave policy. Thank you, Deanna. All right. Oops, I forgot to put in a description there. Um, so right to unionize uh, just means that you, um, as an employee, have the right to organize with other employees to fight for your workers' rights. So the definition of a labor union, it's just a group of employees in the same trade or industry um, or profession, and they basically form to fight for your workers' rights. So labor unions are funded by member dues. So if you are part of a union, you do have to pay into that union. Um, and you also are able to collectively bargain. So instead of going to your employee, uh, employer and saying, I want to be paid more, you would all together say, we want to be paid more um, together. Um, and that usually means you have a little bit more bargaining power because you're bargaining as a collective. You're not just one person that could be fired or not recontracted. You're a group of people and it makes it much harder for the employer to let go a group of people or deny a group of people um, these changes. Um, you can also strike together if you think bargaining is ineffective. So for example, if you're asking as a group, I think some of you have heard in the news, there's, you know, a lot of famous strikes like the one in Hollywood where all the, you know, that's why your movies are going to be delayed for next year. Sorry, but all the actors and um, writers went on strike together because they wanted protections against for um, for again, protections against um, AI and they wanted to be compensated and paid for their work. So I think a lot of contracts that were being written essentially were saying we can use your likeness once you've worked for us and you won't get paid for it. So a lot of actors are saying if you're you, reproducing my face with AI, I have to be paid for that work. So there was a lot of negotiations. They didn't like the negotiations and how the contracts are written out. So they all went on strike. And that's where you saw on the news, everyone was walking around, refusing to work. And basically they all stopped working because they wanted to make a fundamental change for everybody in that union. Um, if you look into union history, it, it's some of it is successful, some of it is not successful. A lot of it is actually very violent. If you study it in history class, there's a lot of um, a lot of different union labor movement like uh, events that have happened. So that's also on our YouTube channel. So I do go over a brief history of labor unions, but just wanted to let you know how they formed. Um, so there is. After all of the movements um, and basically protests and strikes, their NLRA was passed. And it basically guarantees that any employee, um, not any, federal employees can't really <laughs> go on strike, but um, 
most employer most employees do have the right to organize and join a union they have the um they also have the right to strike and picket they have the right to try to improve working conditions and they also you also have the right to not be part of a union so you do have the right to also say i don't want to go on strike i don't want to join a union you don't you can't be um, persuaded to do either or um and so employers, they can't threaten you to not join the union. So for example, I think a big example was Starbucks recently. A lot of Starbucks have, have joined a union and formed one. And I think you, you've you heard a lot in the news probably if you're keeping up with it, but they cannot threaten you or your job if you try to form a union. Um, obviously employers, sometimes big corporations like Starbucks might try to still find a way, but they're not supposed to. Um, you can also question employees about, uh, they cannot they cannot question you about your union activities. So they can't really question you about what you're doing in a union, what, what you guys are talking about, any of that. Um, they cannot promise benefits to try to discourage you from joining a union. Um, and they cannot transfer, layoff, or terminate, or assign more difficult tasks, or punish you in any way if you're trying to form a union. So it is your legal right to form a union if you think that your working conditions can be improved and should be improved. Um, your employers cannot really attack you for that. But again, um, I will say, I will kind of qualify this. Sometimes they'll find a way around it too. So just keep that in mind, but you do have the right to it. Just know it can be contentious if you try um, to form a union sometimes, especially with big corporations like Starbucks. Um, all right, so some resources for you. Um, there is the National Labor Relations Board. So your employer does have to post this. So they do have to put it up in the workplace and, and it pretty much tells you about um, your ability to form a union if you want. And then you can also report violations to them if you think that your employer is um, trying to bully you into not forming a union. Um, there's also resources. If you are interested in forming a union, you can um, look into uh, the work center. They have a step-by-step -step guide as well as some additional resources. All right. Oh, I really forgot to put descriptions in all these. Okay. Retaliation. Um, so retaliation the, is illegal. Um, it, retaliation means that your employer is taking an adverse action against you. Um, for something that for something that you're entitled to. So if you are trying to form a union, that is your legal right. And if they retaliate against you, so that is illegal. Um, what does retaliation look like? So it's not your employer always yelling at you. It could look like some it could look something different. And so let's go over some examples of what retaliation actually looks like. Um, it could be giving you a lower performance evaluation. So they might give you an uh, annual evaluation and just say, you're not a great worker, even though you know that you are. Um, that is a form of retaliation. They might transfer you to a less desirable position, change your schedule to less desirable hours. That could also be retaliation. Um, reducing your pay or reducing how much you work, just saying, you know, sorry, I couldn't schedule you and giving you fewer and fewer hours in the week just until you're not even working part time anymore. Um, that could be construed as retaliation, um, making threats, engaging in verbal or physical abuse. That is definitely retaliation. Um, and retaliation is they could take any of these negative actions against you if you and they cannot do that if you're trying to um, basically fight for your labor rights. So we covered a lot of wage protections that you're entitled to, sick time that you're entitled to, break time that you're entitled to. So if you're trying to access any of these rights and you know complain to your employer that they're not following any of these, they cannot retaliate against you for you just practicing your rights. They cannot do that, okay? And if they do, uh, you can file a complaint with the labor commissioner's office. So just keep that in mind. Um, and the tough part is when you fight for your rights, sometimes you might be fired. Sometimes you might be let go. You can file a complaint, but you still would be out of a job. So that's something uh, to take into consideration as well. But we also, um, all of our school 
members want you to know before you start working, what you're entitled to, what you have the right to, and what you can fight for as well. Okay. Okay. Some random stuff. I didn't know where to put this. Um, okay. So expenses. So your employer actually has to reimburse you um, federally. There's no law about reimbursement. So um, the Fair Labor Standards Act doesn't say that the employer has to reimburse you for expenses. California labor law does. So if you're working in California, your California employer does have to reimburse you for necessary expenditures. So for example, if you have to drive for your work, so if you're a delivery person for your work um, and you're putting all that mileage on your car, you do get reimbursed um, for all of that travel. Um, if you're required to have a uniform, you're also, your employer has to pay or has to reimburse you for that uniform too. Um, and if you're using the internet or the phone a lot, um, if you're training, they also have to pay for the training as well. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. all right. There is a difference between uniform and required clothing. So for example, uh, for under California labor law, if you're required to wear a costume that is considered like a uniform. So at in and out you see all that all the in and out logos on a shirt, that is a uniform, that is a costume. Essentially, if it has the company logo on it, that's usually a uniform. Your employer has to reimburse you for that, okay? So they do have to pay for that uniform for you. They can't, um, uh, they can't really make you pay for all of that. It's needed for the job. Um, and this is specific to California. Um, all right. And then required clothing is a little bit different. Employers do not have to, um, they can require you to wear like all black or for Trader Joe's, if you stepped into that, they require all their employees to wear Hawaiian shirts. They don't have to reimburse you because there's flexibility in that uniform policy. It's um, not necessarily like a costume that you have to purchase. It's something that you might already have in your wardrobe. Um, so if that's more considered a dress code, so there is a slight difference between what they can and, um, they will and won't reimburse you for. Okay. And training. So your employers have to train you for the job. They have to tell you about hazards on the job as well. Um, so just know that those hours you spend training have to be paid hours and they are paid at your regular wage rate. So if you're training to be a cook, or training to work a cash, um, a register, you have to be paid for those hours. They can't just say, come in, we'll, we'll train you and not give you a salary for that. You do have to be paid for all of that, okay? I know we went over so much and I <laughs> feel like all of you are just tired, um, but any questions? I know you guys have um, popped in a little bit. Uh, question throughout. So are there any other questions after this, after we went over all of that? Uh, there have been none that have come through the chat that we haven't already answered. I just wanted to remind students um, to make sure their first and last names are on the screen so that when we capture attendance, we know who was here. Uh, Mary, did you want to still do the exit ticket or no? Um, yeah, we can do an exit ticket, and then I still have prizes, and school's getting close to the end, so we can yeah, do an exit ticket. And fun. yeah, let's do here. I'll do the exit ticket in the in the chat in the chat, and then we'll do a random drawing from whoever filled out the exit ticket. How's that? That's perfect. And I did get one more question that came in. It said, "Would it be illegal for an employer to report employees?" as non-cooperative to other businesses in the sphere, or I guess in the, you know, in their same industry or whatever, in order to give the employee no other options once fired. So let, me, let me repeat that. Would it be illegal for an employer to report employees as non-cooperative to other businesses in order to give the employee no other options once fired? So that's an interesting question. If So the employer can can answer questions as to if the employee is rehirable or not. That's typically the question that people ask to find out if, you know, they, they left on good terms or, or not. Um, they can answer questions 
as a matter of fact, if it is something, if they are disagreeable or, or what have you. Um, however, if it's, you know, just an opinion, that's kind of a, more of a gray area. So as long as they're being factual in the questions that they're asking and answering, that's okay. And if they're not, then that would, that would be problematic. And then you, you could look for some recourse there. I hope that answered the question. I, I think it did. Thank you. It is a tricky one though. And that's why we recommend if you have you if you have documentation like evaluations from your employer, it's good to have those as a copy for your reference too. Um, just so that if you, for example, in this uh situation, if you know that a former employer is you're is talking about you and answering questions, you can always have your evaluations from that employer to kind of also support what kind of employee you were. Um and Normally, um, employers don't ask you for former evaluations to kind of see, but you could have that um, as, you know, additional uh, support for, for the kind of worker you are, if that makes sense. Okay, I will pop in the chat bar um, fancy YouTube channel. Uh, there's a lot of videos on here. We have all of our Friday focuses are recorded, so this one will be recorded and posted on here shortly. Um, but we also have a full playlist. So if you, you know, didn't get bored listening to me talk for an hour, you can <laughs> also listen to me talk for two hours. <laughs> so there's a breakdown of every single topic. I only touched upon really the bare basics, but if you want more information on wage and hour protections, unemployment insurance. So if you are unemployed, if you do lose your job, you actually do, you are covered and you could recoup some um, salary if you're un if you are find yourself unemployed. Uh, there's worker compensation. So if you're injured on a job and, and then can't work for a while, you are entitled to workers' compensation as well. There's also more information. You can see I only covered paid leave for about five minutes. There's a is a there's a 26 minute video on YouTube for you about paid leave, about um, you know, if you get pregnant and you have to take leave, or if you're disabled, if you become disabled or ill. Um, so if you have a serious illness and you have to take like three months off of work, what are your protections? So that goes a little bit more into detail. Um, it's not, you don't have to watch all the videos. That's not homework for you. But if you do need more information about any of these topics, just know it is available for you. So that is our YouTube playlist. Um, and I will also share these slides so that um, if you want any of the links and resources we covered today, you also have access to that. Um, and I just wanted to thank all of you for asking really intelligent, great questions today um, and being respectful of the chat too. It was really helpful to monitor when everyone is, um, is using the chat correctly. Thank you so much. Um, I will copy that PowerPoint. Okay, there's a lot of links going on. Um, the first one is the exit ticket. So if you want to be um, in a drawing for our um, lovely gift certificates, fill out that exit um, form. The next link is a YouTube playlist. So if you want to hear my voice some more, um, you can watch that. And then also the presentation is now available for you in the chat as well. This was a lot of information, but it's really important information for you to know before you start working. Um, we'll stick around for a little bit. So if you have questions and you don't want to ask uh, the questions in front of anyone, that's fine. You can stick around. Um, thank you so much for participating. And it was really, it's always a pleasure to see you guys and and just chat. Thanks. And I was just going to give a, a, a plug for comeback next week, May 3rd. We're going to be talking about soft skills. Um, and we're going to be looking at empathy, which is like being able to understand the feelings of another and situational awareness, being aware of what's going on around you. So I'm going to stop recording so that if you have any questions, you can stay and ask. But again, come back next week. Same time, same link.